Conversations podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Conversations Interpreting Translating podcast and our last Ask Nati episode for 2022. Time flies when you're having fun, guys. Indeed. Eh? Um, very lucky today to have with me in person, would you believe it, all the way from Canberra. We are so lucky. Well, I am anyway. He's watching on his screen. <laughs> Um, I've got the Nati National Certification Policy and Development Manager, Aurelie Sheehan. Welcome. Thank you. And uh, of course, we have Michael Nemridge here as well, National Operations Manager for Nati. Good to be here. Welcome. Thanks. Um, we've got a few questions <laughs> that have come in. We've got about five pages worth, all right? Uh, so, as um, our viewers and listeners know, uh, a few times a year we get together. We take questions directly from practitioners uh, via our online form um, and uh, you answer them. I don't censor anything. I don't edit anything. I ask every single question and I give you a day to prepare. Yep. All mm -hmm. right, so this is as real as it gets. Um, starting from today, I'm going to give names and locations of um, questions as well. Uh, so. Just going to do some really quick draw ones, quick fire mm -hmm. ones, mm -hmm. um, just to get you warmed up. And then we've got some chunky ones after. All right. You all prepared? Good. You all good to go? We are. Oof. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> I think you'll be right. Okay. All right, here we go. This one's from Woody in New South Wales. I have a, a Nati 2 for a long time and I've been working since 1988. With my long time experience, how can I get Nati 3 certificate without paying for a test? Who's taking this one? Yeah, I can answer this one. So I just wanted to start by mentioning that we are not referring to level two or three anymore on the certification. So that's probably in reference to the old system, mm -hmm. the accreditation system. So now interpreting tests are a certified provisional interpreter test and the certified interpreter test, which is the next level up. Um, now, candidates who want to see the test in spite of their uh, ex professional experience would still have to pay a fee for the test. Um, Michael, you might remind me uh, how, how much our test currently. Um, our CPI test, I think, is $583. Yep. And the CI test is... 880 880 um, So. There's no exemption on fees in, in spite of the, of the professional experience mm -hmm. someone might have. They will still have to meet the prerequisites to sit the test as well. And, and there's a fee attached to the test. Yeah. It's for everyone. It's for everyone, yep. yeah. Um, so on the NITI website, more details? Uh, yeah, well, the, the, the fees are on the NITI website. Yep. And uh, the description of the test and prerequisites uh, are available there as well. Uh, okay, same interpreter. Where are you in Sydney? What's your address? <laughs> um, do you well, have an address in Sydney? We do have an address in Sydney. We're about to move offices. Um, there's, uh, we have our main office, um, the admin office, which is in Pitt Street at the moment, and 10 Barrack Street is um, our testing venue currently. Um, we're just signing a lease to move in June. But for now, 10 Barrack Street is our testing venue. All right, very good. 10 Barrack Street, also on the website? Also on the website. Yeah, in the contact section. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a lot of these um, with answers on the website. And the website is? www.nati.com.au. All right, very good. Always happy to answer your questions. But if you don't want to wait until the next episode for some of these questions, um, check out the website. OK. Um, you have a beautiful new venue in Melbourne now where you do the testing there as well. Yep. Yep, so that's great. I remember the old... Uh, West Melbourne offices. Yeah, we have been in some pretty poor locations yes. in the past. <laughs> I think there's finally uh, a, a good venue that um, you know that uh, deserves the name Nati on it. Yep. All right, let's keep going. My credential for recognised practicing has expired, and I was unable to sit for the for the test earlier. I'm ready to do my test now. What is the first step to organise and book for a test? they can start an application in the Mainati uh, portal. Um, so this person had already sat a test, you said? Um, they had a recognised practising 
uh, mm. certification or yeah. Yes. So to now, but, but it expired. Yeah. So now, if the test is available in their language, indeed, they would not be able to recertify their recognition mm -hmm. credential. They have to see the test. So the next step would be to submit an application in MyNati uh, for the test they wish to sit, and then it will be assessed. Once it's been approved, then they can choose a test date. Yeah. Yep. Great. Easy, easy. Ah, here's another one. This is from Jenny from South Australia. As an interpreter and or a translator, can you literally study anything and claim it as PD points? Example, you participate in a first aid course to build your knowledge and glossary because you know the senior group in your cold community wants to offer a group first aid course to the senior group. Mm -hmm. We've answered similar questions before. Yes, um, let's talk about PD. So if I wanted to do um, a first aid course, mm -hmm. can that go towards my uh, PD? Well, so... Yes and no. Uh, I'd say, I mean, this person is mentioning getting, you know, expanding their knowledge in this area and building a glossary. So that would definitely be relevant for professional right. development because domain specific knowledge is important when you're an interpreter or translator. So there are different categories in the PD catalog mm -hmm. um, that um, could, could um, that would correspond to that kind of activities. I uh, can't remember which one. I think it's 1.5 and 1.3. I mean, one is around um, doing some PDs around uh, business development or personal development or some specific areas which may not be skills in translation or interpreting, but they're relevant to the profession. Um, and an, I think another one is domain specific, like a specialization. So this that would really, yeah, that. absolutely. So. Definitely. I'd advise this person to look at the PD catalog and look at those categories. You can download and it on the NATI website. It's available on the NATI website, yeah. indeed. And yeah. There's always, like, at the end of each category, there's one that you can nominate. And you also have that option. Yeah. But I think in that case, in some case, categories would, would, would yeah. uh, match this. Yeah. I think it's worth noting that the recertification was never meant to be onerous. It was always meant mm -hmm. to be flexible enough for practitioners to be able to choose what suited their professional experience mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the outcomes that they required. So if they wanted to be specialists in medical or whether they want to be special in law right. or whether they needed the, the knowledge around tax, the, the recertification catalog is designed to have multiple ways to achieve what you want from your career. Mm -hmm. I mean, interpreting services uh, are needed everywhere, mm -hmm. pretty much. So, you know, you want to go and do a little bit of training in any particular area, I think you can find a way to uh, related to your interpreting or translating experience, I think. Absolutely, and it's very relevant because the development shouldn't just be on interpreting and translation skills. I mean, as we know, the thematic knowledge is very important. So um, there's, it opens a wealth of options in terms of training uh, if you look at those specialization domains. I think yeah. so. Yeah. And, you know, you're not then necessarily just tied into PD events that, exactly. or webinars, yeah. you know. Can, mm. The world is yours, so when it comes to it, sh it should yourself. be possible to do the entire recertification process with spending very little, if not yep. nothing, mm. Mm. towards Definitely. it. Yeah. All right, very good. Um, well, here's a, another very uh, similar one from Yona uh, in New South Wales, and um, Yona's always asking questions, so shout out to you. Keep them coming. Um, she's found a course on income tax from a reputable company uh, associated with taxation in Australia quite affordable, uh, a few months worth of study for either online or face-to-face -face study. Could this course be classified by NIT as a PD? Yeah. Uh, we yep. just answered that question. It's the same, yeah, yeah. Definitely. All right. Hey, why doesn't NIT supply free internet during their tests? The test costs a lot. It won't kill them to give us free internet. It's not like we can download or watch a movie during this time. I'm going to ask this to you, I think, Michael, operations, um, yeah. Yeah. What's with the, what's with the no free internet? It, we can do it is probably the short answer. Um, I've never had anyone ask. So mm. uh, we have public accessible Wi-Fi in our venues now. So I, I don't know the location, um, but there is no reason why we can't. Because I think it specifically says uh, on the website or in mm. one of the videos, like Nati won't be supplying uh, internet. Mm. So maybe that might need to be updated. I mean, yeah. 
these days, everyone's pretty got much mobile Extended. internet. Yeah. Also, all venues usually have unlimited Wi-Fi as yeah. such. Um, I mean, it depends on your cybersecurity measures, I guess. Mm. Uh, but you know, you might want to have a ha have a look at the NATI website and see yeah. if um, that needs updating. Yeah. So, short answer is, we can probably do it. I'll look to making sure that's um, accessible in the new year. Very good. It won't kill you, Michael. No, it will not. All right. I hope. <laughs> Okay, um, that was from Esme in New South Wales. Uh, this one's from Gemma from the Northern Territory. Why do you expect your candidates to be walking encyclopedias when they're sitting for a test? Find me an interpreter that knows everything and can interpret without a debrief or prep. Can I, maybe uh, if I can start on this one, and I really can probably um, add some more detail to it. Uh, and I'm going to do a bit of a, a history one. So. Uh, I don't know when this podcast is going to be aired, but tomorrow. yesterday, tomorrow. Mm. So, yesterday, the 30th of November, is the 10th anniversary of the report improvement to NADI testing. Mm -hmm. So, in April 2011, so NADI's been going since 1977. Uh, we're reasonably experienced at doing this. Um, the accreditation system ran from 1977 right up until 2017. And then we've been running the certification system since 2018. But in April 2011, we commissioned a report which eventually got released called the Improvement to NADI Testing. And it was the result of three universities, Professor Sandra Hale, um, but also contributors from about six or seven other universities that, that led to the release of that report, Improvement to NADI Testing. From 2012 through to 2018, there was comprehensive engagement with industry, so universities, governments, businesses, and interpreters and translators themselves to design the system that we use today. In 2015, 2016 particularly, there was literally thousands of interviews with interpreters of what are the knowledge, skills, and attributes that are required in this business. And so it's not like we've just come up with a test to try and trick people or anything. It was interpreters going, we get thrown into an environment mm. where we need to be able to interpret in quite stressful situations where accuracy is important, et cetera. So mm. it's those interviews and those stakeholder engagement meetings that have led to the test that we've got now, which says, show up and you need to be able to perform in this environment. Mm. So walking encyclopedia, I don't think there is, um, the test format shouldn't require you to be a full encyclopedia, but it should have the requirement for you to know enough in most circumstances to be able to cope at that level. So, you know, CPI tests, it's non-complex, non-specialised terminology, complex and not specialised for CI, mm -hmm. or complex and specialised for our um, specialist tests mm -hmm. and conference tests. So, yeah, it's not like this has come from nowhere and some of the other key things that came out of that report was the need to recertify every three years, the need to be um, up to date with work practice and professional development, um, computerised translation tests, uh, live role plays, all of that stems from that 10 year old mm -hmm. report now, improvement to NADI testing. So I thought worth, there's a couple of questions in here I know that talk about why we do things and how we do things and maybe sometimes saying that we're trying to trip people up. It's mm -hmm. not. This is a, an incredibly detailed report and incredibly lengthy process to get to where we are. Uh, and then the ongoing process for us is we have regional advisory committees that have connections with local hospitals and police and government agencies and interpreters and language service providers. We have a technical reference advisory committee. We're actually um, doing tomorrow, which is high weight people in this industry that industry. help inform us and guide us. We have 36 endorsed qualification institutions that we give detailed feedback on anonymised student performance for their institution, how they go per band rubric, um, down to you know, individual level of what they're tripping up on so we can help improve. Uh, the prerequisite for training was part of the requirement for this improvement to NADI testing. So the, the system might appear from a candidate perspective at times that it might be arbitrary or something, but 
there is multiple checks and balances we have as on an ongoing basis mm -hmm. and the, the development of it itself was quite comprehensive. And also there's nothing arbitrary about when you're working out there in the, in the field and you could be getting drops from any setting mm -hmm. and that's you know at any difficulty level especially in healthcare and legal you know you've got uh, direct impact to people's lives and livelihoods um, so you know I think you do need to know a little bit about everything mm. and I always say to my students you know you make the best pub quiz team members because <laughs> you <know>, <laughs> you're always going to get those um, questions that no one has any idea about um, you know, I got, I got one the other day at the pub quiz and it was, you know, what's the largest organ in the body? Yeah. Skin. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I wouldn't have known that before I was an interpreter, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. Um, but, but yes, definitely. I mean, joking to one side, you do need to low, know quite a lot about quite a lot of things. And that's because, like we are talking earlier, I mean, interpreting, translating services are given and needed in so many different areas. Mm -hmm. that, you know, you can't these days necessarily just just know one or two things about one or two settings I mean it's not realistic as an interpreter as well you're only going to be working in those few different settings you won't get a lot of work would you no so yeah it's the the whole thing for Nadi since the start I guess has been one consumer focus so ensuring that um, the people that need interpreters and translators in Australia have the capable and skilled interpreters they need. And so to ensure that we do the test to the standard it is and put the resources in to develop it. And very much the professionalisation of the industry, which has really been that focus since 2018, um, bilingual does not equal interpreter. And mm. it is an ongoing process for us to help educate consumers and hospitals and the like that you can't mm. use a nine year old kid in a hospital setting, which we still hear constantly mm -hmm. happening. Yeah, I mean, COVID didn't help. We no. went backwards a little bit and I think, you know, we're kind That's of getting true. back onto it now. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, we, we do still hear horror stories. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely a profession and the test is designed as such. And I know that's an extraordinarily long answer to what is quite a short question, but hopefully it gives a little bit more context, which I don't mm -hmm. think we've given on this podcast before, of how we got to where we mm -hmm. are now. And for those who are interested, the improvement to NATI testing report is available on our website as well. I was just going to so say, can we, can we yes. read this somewhere? Yeah. Yes, yeah. it is. And there is additional studies and stuff that went along with it as well. Mm. So 100, sure 132 like pages of it. A yeah. short movie about this, you know, even if it's an animation of the journey to mm. where we were and where we came to, you know, a bit of a timeline, just put it on your YouTube channel. I think it'll be really good to visualise that. Mm. Mm. Okay. This next question is from Nora from Western Australia. What is the difference between the NATI on-site test and the NATI online test, please? Thank you. Yeah, not much. Uh, not much is the answer. So our online tests are currently conducted via, via Microsoft Teams. Um, the test format is the same. <coughs> There's still, for the CPI test, uh, there is still two live video um, instead of face-to-face, -face, but still you can see the actors in it. Uh, and there's one telephone um, task. So same test format, one's online via Teams, one's face-to-face. -face. There's some slight scheduling differences with how we manoeuvre candidates through the process, uh, but that's all gone through with candidates prior to test day, depending on what format they're choosing. About half of our tests these days are online. That's pretty big compared to none in none. the past. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, all our non-professional tests are now online. <clears throat> uh, all the certified interpreter tests, the six tasks um, that are pre-recorded are all online, but for the live interpreting tasks, the CPI test, about half of um, candidates are choosing online options rather than face-to-face. -face. All right, magnificent. And um, you, you can choose now which one you want, right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. All right, wonderful. Uh, look, I have to say that uh, more and more these days, you know, we're doing a lot of remote interpreting. Um, I, I really like to see, in, in all honesty, I'd love to see all three kinds, all three modalities in the one test. I'd like to see one face-to-face, -face, one video, and one telephone. I don't know if we'll ever achieve that, and then that would be like exactly real life situation, you know, but, you know hopefully. Uh, okay, well done, we'll keep going. Hmm. I wonder who can answer this. 
Jenny from New South Wales. Why can some people pass the test, but then they gloat about making emissions, adding insertions and other interpreting sins once certified? Um, you know, I guess uh, they pass meaning transfer, mm -hmm. band one or band two in the test, and then when they get out there, um, they don't perform to the same standard. I mean, I don't know how you can answer to that, mm -hmm. but... <coughs> So, well, one thing we can say is that the certification is only one step in the process. So um, it's hard to comment without seeing a performance, right? Uh, or without seeing the situation in mm. which this has happened. So it, it's a bit difficult, we're out of context, but I'd say if this has really happened and we have a practitioner who is certified and is not, um, because that's in real practice, right? Yeah, it's in yeah. real pr practice. So you know, they pass the test and then they gloat about, say, oh, yeah. I just emitted a whole bunch of stuff. Like, right, in the test? No, 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 no. In, in, real in, life. In, in real life. Yeah. So, yeah, I think then it's about professional conduct as mm. well and maintaining their skills. So, as we know, the test is only one step, but then that's why we have the whole recertification system about maintaining your skills and you know, uh, abiding by the code mm. of ethics. So, I think, you know, when something like this happens, uh, I'd say, you know, uh, for this person um, would be, yeah, for this practitioner to to make sure they keep maintaining the standard. Uh, but for that other person reporting the issue also, you know, as part of professional solidarity as well, like giving that feedback as well, yeah. because we can help each other in improving our own professional practice. Um, and, uh, and, yeah, uh, I guess, yeah, that's that's a way to approach yeah, it. I, yeah, I think so. I mean, I mean, Jenny should talk to this person mm. and, and speak about you know, yeah. code of ethics and um, exactly. you know, professional solidarity, yeah. accuracy. Mm. Uh, us, us interpreters, I mean, and translators, of course. Uh, you know, you need a lot of self moral awareness. I mean, it's not like Do we have mm. other interpreters, translators watching our work or a supervisor. You know, if if it's pretty much all up to you. Exactly. You yeah. know, so you know, if you do make a mistake. Make a correction, mm -hmm. and you can. That's also tested in the certification tests as Absolutely. well, which reflects reality. Yeah. Um, you know, and my recommendation to Jenny is talk to this person and mm. and, and tell them that you know <laughs> it's not the best thing to do to gloat and mm. uh, be happy about all the emissions and insertions that they made. Okay, this is a very very short statement uh, from Hassan in New South Wales. I'd like to apply for NATI certificate. So I'm assuming that's for NATI certification. Mm -hmm. um, very quickly, basic steps to get yeah. them certified. So to be eligible for a test, you need to have met our prerequisites. The prerequisites usually mean doing a diploma at TAFE or university, applying to NATI, being made eligible for the test, sitting and taking test. Mm -hmm. that's, the, right. that's the most straightforward way of going through it for most people. Very good. Uh, in detail, have a look at the website. There's different pathways mm -hmm. um, to different certification levels and you'll find it all in detail there, but it's pretty much you've got to go through some kind of training depending on your certification uh, level that you want to apply for. Mm -hmm. um, and then you go through the steps and hopefully come out through the other end as a practitioner. And I just want to comment on this as well, as part of the prerequisites, the training is a big component, but we also check their ethics and intercultural competencies, mm -hmm. and they also have to provide evidences of the English competencies. So depending on the training that they do, this may already be covered by the training, but if it's not, they would also have to sit in ethics test and an intercultural, intercultural test as part of the prerequisites uh, until they become eligible uh, for the test. So that would be part of the journey, mm -hmm. uh, but it all depends on the training that they have, because sometimes it's covered in the training already. Yep, very good. Um, and is, is there on the NATI website a list of your endorsed institutions where people can have a look and go, <coughs> yes. um, you know, I'm in New South Wales, where can I get this education? Yeah, so as I mentioned before, there's 36 institutions with endorsement, five of those are in New Zealand. Um, the web page for endorsed qualifications is able to be sorted by language or location or um, uh, attainment level, so diploma or masters, etc. Okay, very good. Um, wonderful. Okay, next question. For you, I think. Gaza from New South Wales. I spent a couple of months overseas in an Arabic-speaking country. 
Would that be something to recognize in the recertification points and how many points? Yes. So, yeah, definitely it does count towards category yeah. three. It, it's my favorite, by the way. <laughs> it's Go, great, isn't it? You holiday. get to travel <laughs> <laughs> and you can accumulate some points. Um, yeah, absolutely on the category three of the PD catalog. Yeah. Um, depending on the length of the stay, uh, it may vary between 10 and 40. 10 and 20, no, I 10 think. 10 and 20. Yeah. I think it can't be more than 20 points yeah. per year. Um, but yeah, definitely, and it's a fun way to maintain your I language so skills. So, yeah. Yeah. so I think up to four weeks is 10 points, and then yeah, four I weeks think so. Yeah, and then you can yeah. only claim per research 20 points per year. Per year. Yeah. yeah, it's all in the PD catalog on the website, definitely, but yeah. it's a definite yes. Mm -hmm. All right, wonderful. Um, but it's, it doesn't work the same like if you go to the United States to work extra on your English skills, does it? Or if no. you go to England. Yeah, uh, I does, think does it's that work in the well? like, country, it's like country. It's low yes. country, yeah? Yeah. All right. Very good. Mm -hmm. This one is from Sanie, Victoria. Can Nati provide conference interpreting study assistant program for interpreters? Are all certifications, including conference interpreting, recognized internationally? Mm -hmm. I can answer this one. So at the moment, we do not support um, conference interpreting hmm. training programs. Study assistant yeah, programs. Yeah. No, we, we're not offering this at the moment. Um, and in terms of the recognition of the certification, the conference interpreting certification overseas, um, I mean, the NATI certification is primarily an Australian certification. Mm -hmm. We are getting a lot of, in, I mean, lots of uh, institutions or countries have interest in the NATI uh, certification. Um, however, it may not be known everywhere. So um, it's still a, a good thing to have, uh, to, to show the standard you have acquired. Some con conference interpreters like to combine memberships, so they might mm. have an IT certification, uh, but they might also become a member of AIC, for instance, which is also very reputable. Mm. So it's often a combination of certification. So some countries might um, you know, recognize an ID certification, others might require something else. It's such a broad market as well, the mm -hmm. conference interpreting scene. Um, so, yeah, there may be variations from one country to another. Yeah. All right, very good. Um, and, and regarding the assistance, study assistance program, uh, there are uh, quite a few conference interpreting programs in universities around Australia, mm -hmm. and uh, depending on your um, eligibility, I guess you can be eligible for. Hex, perhaps you know that might be that might yeah. be potentially a, a pathway. Okay, wonderful. Let's move on. Uh, from Ferashte from Queensland, why do examiners take away points over the size of letters, uppercase, at the beginning of a sentence? During the test, I wrote by hand, and I have bad handwriting, but professionally I type. The computer adjusted the capitalizations. Is this something that happens? So it's by the sound of the question. Was this um, a while ago, you think? I, I mean, think I'm pretty it's, sure it's, it's everything's we've been, digitized. Exactly. We've been typing yeah. translation tests since 2018. So. Yeah. yeah, as part of the improvement to NATI testing, we introduced digital uh, testing. I did, I did my first test so handwritten. Did you do yours handwritten? I did it handwritten <laughs> oh as well. And you couldn't rub it out. You had to cross the line. Exactly. So we've moved on from this in 2018 um, and it was with a USB on a laptop yeah, and yeah. now we're doing everything in our online testing platform, pa platform mm -hmm. with proctoring and everything. So I think this is in reference to the old accreditation test because there's also a reference to point deduction and with our, there no points, is there? Uh, with our new system, we're using assessment rubrics, so there's no point deduction anymore. So it's really hard to, to answer this question because that would have been under the accreditation system, so mm. it's not relevant anymore. I think so. I love, mm. I love me a good rubric. Mm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and also, sometimes capitalization can also be an error, so it's really hard to, to discuss uh, this question out of context as well. Yep. Mm. Okay. Uh, thank you. You got anything to add to that, sir? I know. Yeah. That's good. Very good. Um, by the way, uh, Aurelie is also a translator from yeah. Yeah. English into French, both directions. English into English French. Into French. Yeah. And you're a translator in business the, the, numbers. The, the, language, <laughs> the language of awesomeness. All right. Very good. Um, 
This one is from Jay Ling, uh, aka Jimmy. Jimmy's uh, done a lot of things, and I think it just needs to be shown uh, some direction into where his um, certification sits. Uh, may I know what level and category I am? I got a diploma of interpreting and translation in 2015 from RMIT. Same year as me. Maybe I know Jimmy. I have been working at interpreting and translation field for more than 15 consecutive years. I worked at UNDP in Myanmar from 1999 to 05. I worked at UNHCR Malaysia interpreter from 2007 to 2012, then continued interpreting work in Australia from 2003 to date. I have got some professional development points by attending training as well as webinars. To be honest, I'm not NATI accredited. I would be much happy if you would categorize my interpreter level at this stage. Mm -hmm. Sincerely yours, Jimmy. Um, so Jimmy's, Jimmy's mm -hmm. practicing. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy sounds like Jimmy's unaccredited or uncertified or maybe didn't transition. Potentially. Um, I don't yeah. think he's mentioning having a passed the test. Uh, yeah, I don't think, yeah. He, I mean, he does have an, a, a diploma of interpreting and mm -hmm. translation and a lot of experience mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. from all over the world. Uh, so, yeah. Where, where does Jimmy sit? So, our levels are determined based on the test levels uh, that we are offering. So, I think I can comment on this uh, based on. Uh, the qualifications that he has, uh, the diploma level is that would he would definitely meet the prerequisites of our training requirements mm -hmm. uh, for a CPI test. Um, now, a, a certification is not granted based on experience. We do look at work experience for recognition credentials mm -hmm. when testing is not available. But when testing is available, uh, the practitioners have to sit the test to have their level certified. So it's not like we can assess this level based on his experience. I mean, mm. It sounds like he's very experienced, so very I think much, he would yeah. be a great candidate um, to, to take a certification test. And based on the training uh, it's that is completed, do you think would that, that still, be, still considered? be valid? We'd have to look at specific yeah. circumstance, but usually after three years, we would ask for someone to redo the ethical competency right. just to ensure that that was current. Mm. Yeah, because, I mean, if, 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 if Jimmy went to RMIT and said, I want to do the diploma again because, you know, uh, the validation period has lapsed for NATI test, they wouldn't let him do the diploma again anyway. You know, mm. they'll just give him, they'll be like, but no, we'll yep. just give you RPLs. Well, they wouldn't even do that. Mm. You yeah. know, it's so not like you can go and repeat the <coughs> diploma. No. So just to do the ethical competency, probably. Yeah, and Nadi has the um, <coughs> Nadi has an online course for that uh, with its own test mm -hmm. for those that have got training that's a Is little that bit old. Charge? No, it's two hundred and twenty dollars okay. for that test. All right, uh, Jimmy, there's clearly a pathway for you. I mm -hmm. think um, they can write to someone to get yeah, the ball rolling. Yeah, uh, the easiest way to do that would be apply. info at nati dot com dot okay. au um, to ask for specific questions or apply, and then one of the team will assess and get back with the requirements. Mm -hmm. All right, Jimmy, I think there's definitely um, a pathway there for you. Just uh, apply or e email info at nati dot com dot au. All right, you, you heard it from these guys. Uh, he, there's a Two questions very similar, so I'm just going to ask one of them, okay? Uh, this is from AFAF uh, in New South Wales. We used to renew our NATI certification every five years. Why do we now have to do it every three years? My colleagues and I think this is unfair. It's not like we have equipment or machinery to update, only language. I have been an interpreter for a long time. I have done PD and other requirements, yet they are all very similar. Not much change, except the charges are more dearer. Why three years? I mean, what went? What what happened from five to three? Was it all? Was it five? I never. I don't recall it being five. To Wait. be honest with you, yeah. I don't think it's ever been five because, years. Because uh, PD. Um, certification revalidation. revalidation came in in 2007. That's correct. And it was three years. It was three years. And before that, we didn't have, didn't have revalidation. So, yeah, look, I'm not sure. Um, the three years, again, that was, it was already the case. It was maintained when we did the uh, mm. improvement to NATI testing. Um, I'm not, yeah, I'm not and quite like sure. And like you were saying, this was uh, like a major thing. You had academics, practitioners, uh, trainers come in and decide on these things. Yep. Right? 
Um, and uh, look, honestly, I love PD. And when I, as, as a practitioner, I always love to go and source different PDs. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of stuff out there. And like we were saying earlier, it doesn't necessarily have to be interpreter or translator related. You know, the world is your oyster when it comes to PD. There's so much out there. Um, Could I, I add to that um, this question and just the one prior to it as well? It's worth noting NATI certification is not a legal requirement to work in this industry. Mm -hmm. And from the last question, it sounds like certification isn't held, and so you can still work. The organisations and governments that request NATI certified interpreters and translators do so because they believe in our standards, and those standards include recertification, professional development, and the code of ethics. So being part of the NATI certification system is that badge or that resume that says to your potential employer, I ascribe to these things, I ascribe to professional development and work practice and a commitment to the industry and those that choose Nadi Certified are doing so because of those standards. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've got to say, can I add a little comment as well? Mm. You know, it says we, we, we don't operate machinery, it's just language. I mean, I think, I think language evolves just a little bit faster than any mm. machinery. Mm. I think it just Absolutely. evolved now and, yeah. and just now again. You know, and also knowledge. It also updates itself so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's always room for us to upskill ourselves, um, you know, update yeah. our language. I don't live in Turkey anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I'm still watching a lot of even TV shows. So I'm up to date with the lingo as much Same. as mm. I don't enjoy Turkish TV series. Sometimes I hear stuff and I'm like, oh, okay, so this is what's said in Turkey yeah. now. Mm. That's yeah. claimable on your uh, recertification PD, watching Turkish TV, by the way. Very good. Thank <laughs> you very much. I like that. So Turkish TV, um, claim PD. Thank you very much. Uh, but not if I'm watching, like, Mandalorian or anything. But no. What about with Turkish subtitles? <laughs> <laughs> We'd have to We're challenge that. something here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, very good. I'll, I'll, I'll move on. Um, this one's a little bit long, so I am going to uh, see if I can shorten it a little bit. Uh, this one's from Omar uh, from Victoria. Uh, I hope you are all well. I have a question here which is relevant to Nati testing. Uh, in 2018, Nati declared a new system, correct? That's correct. Certification. Uh, I was suspended in 2017. My, provision, my provisional test for two days left for sitting the test while I could not get a reasonable justi justification for that matter. Um, why did they stop me from sitting that test? At that time, the test was only recording mode rather than an up-to-date or maybe like a face-to-face uh, -face test. Why doesn't NATI give equal opportunity to both young people and elders when it comes to testing? Do you think Nati is discriminating against older aged interpreters? Um, why did this happen? Two role players take a single day for all tasks of the test. Um, if this is not bias, uh, this is what happened during my last certification test. My last question is, is Nati a business enterprise earning a profit? If this is not the case, it does not give consideration to old interpreters who have six to ten years of experience. It can reform a certain certification which is pertinent to your experience. Again, I think you've answered similar questions before. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's there's some questions there about, you know, can we get certification from experience? Um, is Nati biased towards all the candidates? Uh, and are you making a profit? Are you a profit-making yeah, uh, business enterprise? There's a whole heap in that. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the first parts of the question refer to the transition from accreditation to certification without knowing the individual. I don't recall ever denying anyone a test unless they haven't met the prerequisites in the new system. Mm. Uh, when the accreditation system stopped in 2017 and then certification started in 2018, 
we wouldn't have had a test available. Did so you, did you finish all the testing in the previous regime and then start? And then started, right. yeah. Right. You, you there wasn't an overlap. You wouldn't have any overlapping. No. There no. wasn't. No. So you wouldn't have said, oh, okay, we're going to cancel your test because now we're going to switch it. So yeah. anyone who applied for the accreditation, they would have mm. done that test yeah. as it was and then probably transitioned or yeah. not. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, and then to the second part of the question, one of the parts of the question, not just the second part. Um, Nadi is a corporation, um, but we're a not-for-profit. We're owned by the nine governments of Australia. They're our shareholders. Um, everything, we're a commercial enterprise in that we charge for tests uh, and we pay for staff, uh, but any profit we make goes back into the industry and any loss that we make is absorbed by us. We get an amount of government funding uh, from each of the member governments that subsidise the cost. The cost of delivering a certified provisional interpreter test is three to four times what we recover for yeah, it. I was, I was just going to say. Uh, which we've said yeah. in a previous podcast. We've said in previous podcasts, yeah. pretty much every test is running at a loss. It's not yeah, yeah. Yes. there's eight to nine people involved in the delivery of a test for a individual. And even at the minimum wage, it doesn't recover the yeah, cost. Yeah. So, um, and I know it's an expensive, we acknowledge that. It's an mm. expensive test. Um, and it's high stakes, so not trying to gloss over that fact, but yeah, Nadi is a not-for-profit commercial enterprise um, that uses business activities and investments to try and keep the cost as low as possible. And where our focus is still that consumers that need translators and interpreters in Australia, or New Zealand now, um, have the people that are suitably qualified and experienced to provide those services. Very good. Did you want to add anything to that? I think you've summarised it yep. very well. Yeah. I think so. Well done. All right. Uh, quick one uh, from Parisa in New South Wales. I'm a Persian English certified interpreter and translator in both directions. I'd like to find out how I can get legal and medical translator certifications. I think she's referring to maybe specialised legal and specialised healthcare interpreting yeah, certifications. Yeah, if it's translation, we certainly do not offer specialised translator tests. So I, I think that's, yeah, in Did reference you used to? to... There was an advanced translator test, wasn't there? There used to be an advanced yeah. translator test. It's still something we would like to make available. Um, but we've decided to focus first on our interpreting mm -hmm. stream and on our, our continuous improvement program. And based on some of the work we're doing in that space, um, we want to inform the design of an advanced translator test and make it a test that is reflecting the current landscape as well of the industry. Um, so that's why it's not available yet. Yep. Um, but for interpreting tests, um, we do have the two specialist tests, legal and health. Um, I have to say it's not available in Persian at the moment. Um, Which languages so far? So at the moment we have six languages that would be... Uh, six already? Yes, oh, wow. so we have Auslan, uh, Mandarin, Korean, Japanese, Spanish, uh, Spanish and... Uh, Did you say Arabic? Ara uh, Arabic, not yet. Uh, yes, Arabic. No, I think Arabic yes, yeah, Arabic. Yeah, yeah sorry. Right, no. <laughs> We've got so many languages. It's I hard know. To uh, last time I checked, it was two. Now it's six. So yeah, well six done. That's in pretty, specialist. Yes. That's so quick. so yeah, it's not available yet. Now um, for to be eligible for this test, you she would ha she or he would have to have a CI credential already um, yep, she, to be she eligible. Has she, she has, has that. that. Yeah. And then we, in terms of training, the prerequisites would be a minimum a bachelor a level qualification. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are different pathways depending on if the um, training is from an endorsed qualification or not. Uh, and then we look at the number of years of experience as well. So there are yeah. different pathways. And, yeah, like which field they worked in. Yes. You know, if they worked as an in-house hospital interpreter, for example. That would be really relevant. We look uh, at that. Then depending on the training or the pathway they're coming from, we might look at if they've done some additional PDs in the area of specialization. Uh, if they also hold um, a bachelor degree in another area, such as a medical uh, area or in the legal field, mm -hmm. then we would also consider that in combination with a CI credential and um, some uh, development or some training in interpreting as well. Yeah. I think uh, what I like Work about experience. you, what mm -hmm. I like about you guys is you, you consider a lot of things. I mean, it's we not do. Just, yeah, it's, it's flexible. It's not just one size yeah. fits all. 
Exactly. Um, you know, you yeah. come, you bring what you have, and then let's talk about it and see what happens. That's right. There are five different pathways yeah. for specialist tests. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Um, on that topic, I'm just going to jump a few questions and tie it into this. What future further employment opportunities may this qualification lead to? We're talking about the certified specialist healthcare interpreter one, interpreter one in this particular one. Do LSPs value this qualification? Do they offer interpreting opportunities that would otherwise not be available to a CI? In simple terms, are there tangible benefits in obtaining this qualification? What has been the take up to date? What has been the uptake? Uh, how many interpreters have applied to be tested and how many have been successful? I think mm -hmm. this is all you. Yeah, we yeah. can be both of us. Yeah, you um, I can start, you okay. can add. So, um, I think regarding the employment opportunity bits, I really want to hear from you because I know how passionate we are in um, you know, focusing more on the professionalising of our industry and you know, getting those wages up eventually mm. as well. Mm. well. Do you want to start with this? Yeah, I well, sorry, I, I didn't. No, that's I, didn't okay. know. <laughs> no, no, I just know that we've had passionate yeah, talks no, about this all before. Good. All good. Yeah, and look, the specialist um, specialist credentials were added as part of that improvement to NADI testing mm -hmm. report, that's and right. as the, didn't exist in the previous system. So it's very much noting that there is a great demand for high level skills um, in courts and in hospitals for specialist credentials. That's why we introduce them. Uh, I think we ran about 10, 15 people uh, through in the last 12 months. Um, we have got our first people that, so it's a two part test. There's a knowledge test and an interpreter test. Mm -hmm. So not all the people have done both parts, but I think, can you correct me here early, we've issued four people in the last couple of months, just yeah. recently. So there is more than that, um, but the first few have already got through. Uh, and it's so brand new that I don't think it's fully been accepted and agreed to by the industry. I, so I, I also think that it's a really good way of recognising these interpreters who are already at that level. Like I know Absolutely. a lot of interpreters mm. who are, you know, at that specialist level and, and th they give their heart and soul and, and you really see how professional and they are and yep. how skilled they are. And I think it's a really good way to recognise that skill and, you know, to be able to be in that step just a little bit mm -hmm. above the certified interpreter, yeah. I think it goes a long way. Yeah, and it is growing. Like We were talking to um, a group that's about to put an LSP that's uh, about to put scholarships through for dozens of their people to do advanced training and then go through the test. So it's really starting to gain some traction, mm -hmm. um, but it's brand new as well. So over time, I think absolutely it shows that people that are at the pinnacle of their career as an interpreter in this space uh, and it is starting to be recognised as such by the courts and hospitals that require them. And I think, uh, I, I don't know about all language policies of all states, but generally speaking, it, they, it states the highest available, exactly. the we highest should, available, yeah. 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 So I think that eventually when there are enough or, or you know, higher number of um, specialist interpreters out there, when someone requests a particular interpreter if that interpreter is av available, the job has to be given to them because that's what, that's what the language that's policy states, be, yeah. right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, we don't know if it will eventuate very quickly, but I think we need to kind of like build that base of practitioners and then it will eventually become um, business as usual by giving them the jobs first. Yeah. And I think that's, that's how it will mm -hmm. probably work out yeah. and that's how our LSPs will have to fall in line as well, I'm assuming, because mm -hmm. of the language policy wording. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, I think that that's how it should be. Um, and I think there was a part on, yeah, how, like, if they should be valued or paid more. And um, and I think they should. Uh, no, 100 Because of they the, the higher level of skills and certifications, that's not something that Natty uh, influence, I mean, decides on. This stays with the LSPs. Uh, but there's certainly something that should be rewarded. Yes. Um, and uh, and recognised. Yeah. We spoke in our previous um, conversations. Uh, there were enterprise agreement talks going on. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if specialised interpreters are being considered during that enterprise agreement. Um, and if it's not, maybe someone should talk to hmm. them about it. I think Professionals Australia is um, leading that. Uh, you know, while while they're at it, maybe because you know, this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. This is eventually going to happen. 
uh, there's going to be, I think, hundreds of um, specialist interpreters out there in, in both the fields, and you might even introduce other fields, you know, moving forward. Um, so I think food for thought, mm. while, while they're at it, maybe they introduce it, so then you don't have to worry about it, you know. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, this one is from Fort Bin in Victoria. I'm a primary carer for two of my elderly parents who are high dem highly demand on everyday life activities and specialist medical appointments in the hospital, which has virtually taken up a lot of my working hours in order to meet the NATI recertification. I was wondering whether I was able to apply for working hours exemption or reduce working hours due to family difficulty. Please advise. Thank you very much. Mm. So yeah, we do make exemptions or you know, in certain situations. So um, I guess the best advice we can give to this practitioner is to contact us directly so we can assess the situation and, and let them know what's possible in their situation. But we certainly consider that. Because we've been speaking over COVID as well. I mean, mm. you reduce those. Yes, we have. You reduce yeah, the work requirement. That. You reduce the PD requirement. And, Absolutely. And you, you, you always say that, you know, personal circumstances, come and chat to us about it. Yes, and that's like we right. were saying earlier, it's not just everything's not set in stone. Come and mm -hmm. chat to us about it. Mm -hmm. You are uh, pretty flexible and understanding. Uh, this one is from Sayoko in New South Wales. Pretty valid, actually. I've, I've, interesting question. I've been receiving a lot of emails, particularly in the last six months, from various interpreting translating companies. Many are located in India, a few in Australia. They say that they found me in the NATI directory. Most of them offer extremely low pay per word. How are we to discern they are legitimate and truly, uh, and they truly find us from the NATI directory? Thank you. Yeah. As a practitioner, I get these yeah. as well. I, yeah, same. Some agency mm. I've never heard about, and exactly. someone uh, offered me mm. a job today for like ten dollars or something like yeah. that. I was just like, I, mm. I do receive those as yeah, well. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, unavailable. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So look. It's not something Natty actually can really advise on, or we don't have processes around, you know, checking the reliability of mm. LSPs. I think it's it really uh, remains with uh, the practitioners and their discernment as well. I think the first thing is a company who is ready to pay very low rates for professional services that require a lot of expertise. Uh, I think is already a sign that they may not be reliable. Mm. Um, and are we ready to work for these rates as well as professionals? I think, you know, uh, uh, that's also part of our code of ethics as well. Okay. I think to maintain professional uh, solidarity and ensure that we all uh, are asking for a fair pay uh, so it doesn't undermine the industry. So I think that's something to keep in mind. Um, now, more practically, not as I said, we're not offering anything like this, but uh, there are some uh, online services that do offer uh, information about LSPs and uh, I'm thinking of prosy.com mm -hmm. for instance. Uh, members have access to what they call a blue board where you can uh, check LSPs and kind see like what... Kind them in a way. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And so practitioners who have worked for these agencies will leave some feedback, a rating. And so sometimes it can be re really useful to look at this, but I think you have to be a member. Uh, so that's a good tool. It's a practical tool. Um, but yeah, I, I think the bottom line is also to, I think, use uh, your own good judgment. Do a and, bit of and, research. And a bit of research. Yeah. Try talk to colleagues. Maybe they have worked mm. with this agency, and they can give you a little bit of information. Um, but I think it goes down to professional practice and our code of ethics. I think uh, is a good support there to to make the right decision. I think so. Can I add also Please. that on the online directory? So there's two ways. Um, first one is we have a practitioner verification tool on our website. So. If, uh, hospital or government agency types in the CPN number, uh, it will come back whether that is a valid practitioner. Mm -hmm. So that's that's mm -hmm. something that people can't opt out of, but all that will return to the person that types in the practitioner number is whether they're certified or not, uh, when it expires and what credentials are held. Mm -hmm. The secondary part is we have our online directory, which potentially is where this has come from. Mm -hmm. Practitioners have the ability to change all of the details available in that online directory. So you can't opt out of the verification because that's an integral part of the system. Mm -hmm. But 
in your Minati portal, as a practitioner, you can change whether you want any details shown at all, uh, whether you want your phone number shown, whether you want your email shown, whether you want your state or address shown. So you can choose one or some or none of those mm -hmm. things. As a default, when we issue a credential now, in the um, uh, from about two months ago, as a default, all online directory is off and it is up to someone to opt in to mm -hmm. those things. Uh, for people prior to about two months ago, it was name and credential was shown, but none of the contact details was the default. We've mm -hmm. changed that to stop um, people constantly trawling through and looking for names and trying to match them. So everyone's got the ability to update what's shown on the directory. And if you don't want to receive cold calls like this and you just want to work with the language service providers you're comfortable with within mm -hmm. Australia, I would recommend updating your details to remove your contact. Mm -hmm. Were we having talks about, I don't know, maybe I'm just making stuff up, um, like LSPs being on NATI, like NATI endorsed LSPs, were you thinking about like giving like a NATI? That's something that needs a lot more we were talking, discussion. We were talking yeah. about this back in the day, I think. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, maybe one day in the future you can go down and find a list of agencies as well. Yeah. Um, okay, wonderful. Uh, getting towards the end there, and I'm, I'm going to ask you like the biggest, chunkiest one at the end. Sure. All right. That's what we're here for. <laughs> I think your answer is going to be shorter than the question. Uh, it, this one's not it. Uh, this one's from Lenair from New South Wales. Will the recertification for recognised translators continue to be every third year? Any other changes ahead? We already spoke about yeah, this. It will continue yeah. to be every three years. Three years. Yeah, no change yeah. is yeah. planned. The only change that will come up is we will probably revisit the um, professional development recertification catalogue at some point in the next That's 12 right. to 18 yeah. months to ensure that it's relevant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Again, uh, uh, almost a repeat question, but I will read it out. Uh, for recertification, as interpreters, we are required to have done a certain number of interpreting assignments per year. Mm -hmm. For some languages, such as Iranian or Farsi, at present, there's over a supply of interpreters. Uh, there is an oversupply of interpreters and not much interpreting assignments. How do we achieve it, or will there be special consideration in this case? Well, we'd have to look at Can each you individual Can you actually have a look at languages situation. and see how much work there is for languages yeah. it, it's in sort of certain one of the, states? Yeah, one of the previous questions about every individual mm -hmm. circumstance yeah. is taken into account is probably the right um, yeah. answer for this because we're not going to say, oh, we believe there is X number of hours in mm. Persian each year, so therefore you're... You can't say that because that'll change like that. that. I would, for this yeah. particular um, practitioner, professional development is the big one. Mm. So if you've done all the professional development but have struggled to make the hours, it's going to be looked at far more favourably than if mm. you've done no PD and no work practice, because no yeah. then we're saying, well, are you actually trying to get mm -hmm. work or are you actually mm -hmm. active in the Practicing. industry? Yeah. yeah, I think that's the important, are you active in the industry? Yeah. yeah. Right. And then there may be opportunities like volunteering opportunities or even uh, assignments that are from overseas clients that you know could be other opportunities to ha to do more hours if there's not enough in Australia as well. Like they, they could be other opportunities they could look like potentially knowing that the time zones may be challenging yeah. but sometimes there are opportunities um, overseas as well that could you know be considered. All right, very good. Uh, this one, last of the short ones. Uh, from Rosalba in Victoria. What is required to be recognised as a translator? I want to say though, it says uh, her language is Italian. Mm, All yeah. right, so keep that in mind. Yes. Maybe two questions there. You know, how do you get recognised as a translator, and can you do so in Italian? Yeah. yeah. So recognition for recognition, we look at the prerequisites, just like for testing. So training prerequisites, intercultural competency ethics competency and English competency. So this doesn't change, it's the same as for the test. Um, the only difference is that instead of sitting a test, if it's not available for this particular language, then we look at work experience. So that would be basically based on the work do experience. Do they still have to do the skill set minimum? We would consider yeah. the skill set as well. Um, now, Italian is available for testing, mm. so recognition is not uh, available for this language. This person would have to sit the certified translator test. Mm -hmm. And that's the only test at the moment for that's translation, That's the only right? test, yeah, yeah, available for now, yeah. Uh, for all languages? For all languages. So, not all languages that we test. Uh, we have 38 languages available for translation. 
So that would be yeah available yep. in so 38 languages. So you can languages. be recognized yeah. or you can be certified. That's right. Certified. Yeah. Okay. You got anything to add to no. that, sir? Are we no, ready? Good. Ready for the big one? Ready for the big one. All right. So for the finale, um, I'm going to read this out because it says here at the end, should be interesting to see if this makes it to the podcast and what lame excuse Nati reps will answer. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the last line. I've got to say most of this is a comment, I think. Um, so you can draw out questions from there if mm -hmm. you like. There are some rhetorical questions there, um, but I think it does need to be read out uh, because you, 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 know, you need to answer to this, yep. okay? And here's your opportunity. Hello. I'm beginning to think either Nati is a money-making scam or is gaslighting us. I asked one of the workers at Nati, what is the pass rate? They said 35%, but that they did not know the details. Nati needs to release this information for all languages. Needs to be known in courses and before applying. Even Ivy League universities in America give you the odds of applying versus given a spot to study. It's pretty low, but people are aware of this and still apply. We keep hearing there is a shortage of interpreters. Must not be such a shortage if Nati passes only one third of people. Going off by these numbers. You claim that you have practice material on your website, yet practice material were 100% easier than the actual exam. Again, you're gaslighting us. No mining practice material for my language. One of the requirements before you sit for Nati exam is training education. We pay money and a significant amount of time to complete. Fine, done. Practice health, legal, social security, migration, education, aged care. Trainers tell us these are the domains that we generally deal with daily. Pay the huge amount for the test, study for the exam, and then you sit the exam. We are given mining for the exam. According to Nati, we have 15 minutes to prep for the exam, essentially taking 15 minutes to become experts in this area. Yeah, right, impossible. Imagine if a brain surgeon or a heart surgeon only had 15 minutes to become experts and prep before they cut you open for surgery. Did my course mention once about mining? No. Did I study for mining? No. Did I think I would be tested for mining? No. Is Nati being unfair? Yes. Not everyone deals well under exam conditions. You think Nati cares, they see you as a walking credit card. Nati either needs to allow candidates to choose their domains, give notice in advance about the domains days before, and brief so time is not wasted on studying non-tested domains, or the system needs an overhaul. The testing system sucks. You claim on your website that there are 20 recommendations and the easiest one is right there. Give three days notice of domains briefing. Universities tell you which part of the course you will need to study for as it will be assessed in exams. A medical student will be told to study circulatory system and not to expect an exam on urology. A legal student will be tested on criminal law and they don't need to study employment law. The dozens of domains are too broad at the moment for Nati. You expect interpreters to have so much knowledge in all areas and domains. I guess you expect the same from candidates to have the same level of experience and knowledge. I, for one, have no idea about mining. Never dealt with the world of mining. Fun times. I was surprised I did not have a heart attack right then and there. Nati would have been liable. I wasted so much time studying for a test I know I will fail. I studied until my body and brain were on fire and collapsed in bed, rinse and repeat. You guys need to do better. Should be interesting to see if this makes to the podcast and what lame excuse Nati reps will answer. Uh, this is from Marcia in New South Wales. Uh, well, it made it to the podcast, um, and I'm waiting for your I'll, lame excuses. I'll now. start, I'll, yeah. Yeah. and I'm if sure you, you can start, contribute. Yeah, can. There, 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 is, there is a lot there. There is a lot. There. There. Yes. Uh, I think I might do like a whole episode on this, <laughs> but let, let's try to. <laughs> so uh, so let's out. start yeah. with the starting point, which is uh, what I talked about before. This is a 10 year process now, Absolutely. and the yeah. continuous improvement program. Um, that orally will give more detail on is our commitment to making sure that improvement to Nadi testing report and the recommendations from it and the knowledge, skills and attributes that thousands of practitioners said were required in the industry 
stays relevant to mm -hmm. the industry. Re remembering that the people, the consumers that ask for NADI certified practitioners are doing so because they believe in what we do. Mm -hmm. It's not a legal requirement for them to ask for it. Mm -hmm. They are asking for it because they believe in what we do and how we test and the standards and the ethics that go with it. We don't release um, candidate test results or the, the pass rates because they're easily taken out of context. Um, and that's going to sound like a lame excuse. So the, the way to justify that more well, that, that was is, expected. Yeah, that's <laughs> expected. I looked at a European language um, yesterday uh, with pass rates. And there'd only been eight people since 2018 that had taken that test. Of those eight people, the majority had done an 11 week skill set course. I, we know from internal data that um, the higher the um, credential or the higher um, the education that you've done, you are far more likely to succeed in the NARTI test, as would be expected. It's a high level professional test. Mm -hmm. If you've dedicated your study to a master's degree or bachelor's degree in interpreting and translating, you are far more likely than someone that has had a 10 week or an 11 week course mm. to be successful in this test. So if we put the pass rate for that small European language against a Mandarin, which has hundreds of people, many of whom have done advanced diplomas or master's, master's. degrees, mm. it would either look like the small European language um, examiners were being biased and failing people at an unnecessarily high rate compared to Mandarin. But again, that's where the context comes in mm -hmm. because I know that I've got tests that could be 60 to 80% pass rates when the three people who have taken that test session have got master's degrees. But if I've got a test session with four people that have done a skill set and no, none of them pass, how is that easily comparable? So mm. we don't release the results because of those factors that I've just said. It just, you can't compare them. And if you take them in isolation, then it opens people up to um, unfounded conclusions that there's either bias in the test results or the like. So that's why we don't do that. Um, and where do I go with the next part of that question? It's very long. Uh, the money making scam. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, you're the money guy, oh, yeah, operations yeah. guy, yeah. So, you know. As I said at, um, in an earlier part, again, this, this process has been, this is a complex test. It is. Um, mm. And if anyone wants to try and disprove what I'm saying, just work out how many, how much it costs to have nine people in a room for a two hour test. And then yeah. compare that against what we charge for it. This is now, I think it asked almost every single episode. You know, there seems to be this common understanding that Nati makes a lot of money from these tests. I mean, I understand for interpreters and translators who already, you know, aren't making a lot of money, it's a few hundred dollars, we said, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. five, six hundred, eight hundred dollars around. Yeah, we yeah. acknowledge it is yeah, an expensive and, and, test. And, and mm -hmm. we said that, but I think it needs to be, no, I'm not trying to be on anyone's side here, but being involved as an, uh, you know, I can say that now, as an examiner mm -hmm. um, and as a role player a few mm -hmm. years ago when I was first starting off, like, there is a lot of people involved, you know, so maybe you, you need to even, you know, put a little bit of a explainer on how much you're paying and how much we're paying for all of these people. So just, just, just not necessarily to prove a point, but just to be transparent about it, because this question is now being asked over and open, over and yeah. over again. Everyone seems to think that you guys are in some kind of a rort where you know, you're just taking people's money and mm -hmm. failing them and pocketing the money. I mean, yeah. and we keep saying that it costs three, four times more than the price that people actually yeah. pay. But even if, you know? so even if you don't believe that part, from us. NATI exists to ensure that consumers get professional interpreters and translators right. with the knowledge, skills and attributes that are required to succeed in a multicultural society. If we take shortcuts and just bump pass rates up, um, then that is a failure and the profession will suffer, suffer mm -hmm. for that. Yeah. And humans will suffer for mm -hmm. that. There is plenty of examples of people that have had medical procedures go wrong or lost their lives because, or been locked up 
been incarcerated for decades because mm -hmm. there wasn't a qualified interpreter. So yeah. we take that responsibility very seriously. If no one could pass our test, if it really was a money-making scam <laughs> uh, and we just wanted to fail people, our system would collapse because if no one could get certified, there would never be a certified interpreter available when one was required and therefore trust in the ability of the system to cope when there was a requirement would disappear if no one could ever get the person that they needed. So it is in our interests to have as many people pass as possible take all the financial part out of it. We want as many interpreters as possible in the industry that have the knowledge, skills and attributes required. There is no point us putting people out there or saying that they're qualified when they're not. And the, the requirement that we have, the prerequisite requirements for training, was one of the recommendations for the improvement to NADI testing, was for formal training because mm -hmm. prior there was none. And it is an integral part of being one, better prepared for the test, but two, being able to perform when you are out in the industry. So we desperately want people to be qualified and pass the test because one, it supports the system more broadly, but two, it supports the consumers that need it the most. Uh, very good. Uh, there's some things there for you as well, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Um, you know, all these domains, uh, Institutions training you for healthcare, social welfare, um, legal, mm. education. Yeah. You know, these are the domains that we think that we're going to get the, the test material in. Um, mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, you sit down and bang, the brief comes and it's about mining. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's in reference to um, the CPI uh, test, which yeah. is our first level uh, of interpreting test. Um, there is a, a variety of domain uh, that are tested in this in this test. It's a c more targeted towards um, community interpreting with live dialogue tasks. So there is a range of domain, and uh, there is an expectation that candidates can deal with this variety of domains. We don't, and we, we've commented on this in previous questions. Mm -hmm. um, this is part of their training and they are in professional practice there may be more uh, assignments in legal or mm. in health but there may be uh, assignments in other domains so we offer that variety of domain uh, and that's part of the preparation and the training of the candidate to make sure they've got that broad knowledge as well. Um, now there was a comment about the brief being given 15 minutes in advance and expecting that um, How can you be an expert they, in become an expert these tests are uh, non-specialist, non-complex tests. So I think that's important to remember this. They're not our specialized tests. So the level of knowledge, uh, of domain-specific knowledge that is expected is not expected at the specialist level. Um, and it is true that we are providing the task brief 15 minutes in advance of the task. So they have a 15-minute preparation uh, time. Now, um, Michael has mentioned the Continuous Improvement Program, which is a program we've launched back in 2021. Um, there's been a lot of uh, data collection from our candidates, but also from our examiners and all the examiner training we've been doing. And we've also consulted a group of experts as well as part of this process. And we're looking at refining aspects of the current certification system. And some of these aspects and recommendations, which are on our website, are around the testing uh, environment, the testing conditions, and looking at how we can improve some of, of those aspects. And one of them is the preparation. Uh, we have listened to the candidates' feedback we've received, um, which uh, was actually asking for more preparation uh, and knowing the domain in advance. Uh, and I'm you know, pleased to announce that we will um, uh, introduce this as part of one of our recommendations. So at the moment, it's not available because in the back end, we need to make some system improvements yeah. so we can actually send the task briefs to our candidates automatically. And this will be available, I think we're aiming at April to April 2023. Okay, um, that's just, uh, that's right. just around the corner. Exactly. Uh, so at the rate bear with the, us, at the rate it's coming. Time is advancing these days. That's just the Sound exactly. Like just a of weeks away. So, what does this mean? Candidates will have 
the task brief uh, three days prior to the test day, which means they'll have a 50 to 100 word uh, brief um, related to the task they will have on test day, and they will know which domain it will be in. So it will give them a co couple of days to get ready, to be in the right headspace, and, yeah, and yeah. familiar with the domain. Yeah. Um, look, I think there was a bit of a, a shout out to there to the institutions as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we weren't prepared for this particular domain. This is just now me asking a question. I mean, um, I know that you have a whole bunch of examiners preparing content, uh, mm -hmm. exam material mm -hmm. with uh, NATI staff. Mm -hmm. uh, is there some kind of miscommunication between institutions where, you know, I, I could see this potentially happening, mm. uh, but it depends on language. Like, I don't know, this, the language here says Portuguese. I don't know how much um, uh, Portuguese language is maybe mm. come across in mining situations. Like, for example, I, I used to do role play for my Mandarin students, and, you know, they did a lot of tourism, business, mm -hmm. interpreting, and what I do with my Turkish um, uh, students, you know, it, it's more healthcare, legal, mm. and... Uh, it, I mean, there's a whole bunch of variety of domains that come up in the test as well. Mm -hmm. Is there some kind of communication or miscommunication that could be between NATI and the institutions and what kind mm -hmm. of domains are covered? Mm. Look, I mean, we're not influencing the design of the training courses, so it's really up to each institution. Uh, what we do, though, is with our endorsed qualification institutions, we do share uh, quite a lot of information around our test formats, including our test specifications. Mm -hmm. So they would be well aware of the domains that are considered um, in, in our test. Um, this information is also available on our website, so even if um, a non-endorsed qualification uh, institution uh, is looking at preparing the candidates for the NATI, the students for the NATI test, they would also have access to this information mm. from our website. So it is out there and it is the training institution's responsibility as well to ensure they train the students in the best way possible to uh, make them proficient professionals in the future as well. So this is not something we can directly influence, but we do have, um, we do collaborate a lot with our endorsed qualification institutions and they have that information. Mm. All right, well, I think I think there's one more point on that, yeah. if I just uh, recall the question yeah. properly, which is about the practice test. Yes, I was about uh, to say. They're not 100% easier than the actual tests because they are actual tests. Exactly. To create practice tests, we retire old test material. Oh, wow, mm. there you go. So yeah. it costs you again more money to make new tests because you've actually... Exactly. We retire old ones. Yeah. So, okay. and so they're actual tests. They, they are. Ha they have been sat by candidates in the past, yes. Exactly. Okay. And the development of our test materials undergoes a, a really uh, robust process. We work in collaboration with our examiner panels. There are robust quality checks that happen internally as well. So everything is double, triple checked to make sure all the test materials are aligned with our test specifications and are uh, standard across uh, all the tasks. So um, this this is not just a text we put on the website for practice. There has been a solid process uh, to ensure this is meeting our test specifications. So, okay, yeah. very good. A um, few questions from me. How are you going? Good, thank you. Yeah, good. <laughs> yeah we're, well. we're, we're almost there. Um, look, thank you for another amazing year. Uh, how fast has it flown? Oh. Crazy, apparently. <laughs> Crazy, it's, apparently don't it's tell December. me about it. Apparently it's summer. <laughs> Uh, not mm -hmm. here in Melbourne, still not. Um, but we were in Brisbane just a few days ago uh, for the Ozit National Conference. We were, I just want to big kudos to the organising committee, Ozit National Conference, um, the Brisbane committee. Amazing, just such a good event, and I had a lot of fun. I never Me thought too. learning could be so much fun. <laughs> to be honest with you, you missed out, Michael. I um, did miss out this year. <laughs> you missed out. Hopefully, we'll see you there next year. But um, you had a really good, good presentation too. Thank, Thank you. you on your presentation. How's the continuous improvement program going? Where are we at? We've seen the 20 recommendations. Mm -hmm. What's coming up in 2023? 
Well, there'll be quite a lot coming up in 2023, so watch this space. I've mentioned um, interpreting brief being available prior to the test. We are introducing more changes. I mean, I don't, I don't think we'll have enough time in this podcast no, no, no. We'll, to cover we'll do another everything. One. We'll do another one next but year. But they, they will definitely be um, quite a few changes in our interpreting stream. I mean, they're not changes, they're improvements, refinements. Mm -hmm. So we really want to um, give candidates the best testing experience possible by providing more support and, um, and a more streamlined interpreting stream as well. Um, but yeah, I think we'll have to do another podcast. Oh, definitely, but we've, we've got some yeah. stuff to look forward to in 2023. Absolutely, yeah? it will be a big year. Okay, mm -hmm. and you know, what I've always said about you guys is there's no beating around the bush. You decide on something and then, you know, it realizes mm -hmm. not too far after that. Um, question to you, what's happening operationally? Is there anything new we can look forward to? Anything you want to announce um, that you can announce? <laughs> you know, what are you looking forward to for 2023? Uh, as the NATI National Operations Manager. 2023, we'll have a new testing venue in Sydney, um, which I'm super excited about. <clears throat> um, uh, in a previous podcast, we've said it, but um, really getting into our stride of, uh, now that we've made some of the changes with the um, continuous improvement program, particularly the one which splits the certified interpreter and CPI tests, mm -hmm. Um, it's given us more capacity in test venues for face-to-face -face testing and for online testing as well, which is hosted out of our states. So we're able to offer more frequency of every language. So definitely heard feedback from candidates and from institutions about the long lead time between tests. You know, mm -hmm. we might have run Hungarian once a year, for example. Uh, from the middle of 2023, we sort of get into a cycle with all 50 migrant languages and 10 sort of indigenous languages testing at least every six months. So uh, a, a regular language, let's use Hungarian as an example, will be um, CPI test, then there'll be a CT test, then another CPI test, then another CT test. Mm -hmm. So every three months there'll be a test in that language oh, and you should never be more than five to six months away. So, mm -hmm. and that really, we've so got our test calendar out till 2025 um, up available for everyone yes, to I see. Saw that. Yeah, so that's really, that really starts kicking off from the middle of next year, that cycle, and that's been allowed because of the changes we've made by taking CT tests, CCL, which is our non-professional test, uh, and the CI tests online, and that's freed up the capacity in the venues to test the number of languages that we're doing from that, that point. That's a huge thing, because, I mean, you can plan ahead, but also sometimes, you know, you're finishing your education program doesn't always line up with the test straight after it. You know, we've had we've had candidates that have completed their training and their tests were like seven, eight months. Yep. You know, yeah. so I think I think that'd be that'd be really good just to see that you know regular number of um, tests in languages. So you know when you're going to sit that test mm -hmm. and you can look forward to the test. You know? That's right. Yeah. All right. Very good. Anything to add from you? 2023. What's happening? Well, well, um, just. Thinking, well, you've, you've said a lot already. I think the CI split is one of the big ones. Um, but we'll be looking um, at dialogue task. We'll be reviewing the format of the dialogue introduction as well. Um, as part of our continuous improvement program, I think it goes really well in, in line with um, the other changes we're making on the interpreting stream. Um, we want, again, to improve candidates' text experience and giving them that opportunity to familiarize themselves a little bit more uh, with the role play accent and oh, there, nice. and so give them. Because it can uh, be a little bit stressful when you it go there. It is a bit stressful. So, really, with the continuous improvement program, we're looking at um, removing as much as possible those external factors that can come in the way of a, a good performance. Uh, and so we're looking at uh, making those changes. So again, that will be coming in, in 2023. Um, we will also be introducing a, a white list of online resources for Ooh, our translation just, test, yeah, this, which this will be a, a really big one. one. Yeah. Our candidates Naughty, have been asking for times. it. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, it's, it's a cycle. It's a continuous yeah. process. And we're really looking at making things better as much as we so can. Mm from translating with pen and paper. Pen and paper, <laughs> USB and laptop, and now online testing online with proctoring testing. and a white list of online resources. So we're keeping up with the time, yeah. Well done, well done. All right, well, nothing more from me. 
I just want to say a big thank you uh, again for coming out here. I'm so lucky to have you in person this time around. Um, I know it might not be the case next time, um, but I'll take what I can get. And whenever you're in town next, or maybe I'll come to Canberra. Visit. Sounds fantastic. Always Why welcome. Why not? Yeah. Sounds good. Well, maybe the next um, Ask Nati is from Canberra. I haven't been there since I was 10, so I look, I look forward to that. <laughs> um, look, on behalf of all our viewers and listeners, and we've got quite a lot of international um, uh, viewers now as well, uh, so I've made you famous around the world. Uh, so people might be asking for autographs. All right. Maybe. We'll yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I heard that like you're actually pretty famous. Um, Apparently. Yeah, thanks, yeah. thanks for the podcast, so great. Uh, big thank you to you. Um, I really appreciate your time. I appreciate your honesty, your transparency, and your expertise. And I look forward to many more chats in 2023 and beyond. And, and you know, just all these chats we had today and see how that all realizes over the next year. And then hopefully some more meaty, chunky questions <laughs> like that one. Um, and we ask pretty much every single question um, Go back and watch the previous episodes. Uh, have a see, have a look there, and see if there are questions already there that have been answered that you want to ask. Um, have a listen. If you still want to ask them, <laughs> send it through. I'll ask them again. Um, but yeah, have a look at uh, the Conversations YouTube channel. Uh, listen to all the previous podcast episodes. I mean, there's an Ask Nati playlist there as well. If you just want to focus on Ask Nati, it's I think it's also on the um, Nati YouTube channel as well. Um, so, you know, uh, have a look there too. And um, wishing you a very happy new year and a very festive holiday season. And uh, we'll see you sometime next year. All the best. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Conversations Podcast.